Hi, I did a video a week or so ago about my concepts about embouchure formation and you know my journey, how I got there. Um, I got lots of great feedback um, from lots of folks from all over. Um, got some questions. I got some folks saying, "Yes, I figured this same stuff out. Um, this is how I was taught, and it, you know, it's been great." I also got some people saying I was ruining you know, children in the future. So I must be doing something right, you know, so <laughs> anyway. Um, so if you didn't see that video and you want to, I'll, um, if you're watching on Facebook, I'll put a link in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll try to put a link. Hopefully it's right there right now. Um, if I do it right. Um, anyway, so a um, few questions I had, I just wanted to cl clarify. Uh, I, I wanted to clarify a few things from that video that people, a, a few people had asked about and also expand on a couple of concepts that I also had lots of questions about. Those concepts are what I call the sweet spot of the trumpet and the immediacy of response, which I also talk about a lot. So uh, first, let me just kind of some of these questions I had, you know, some people ask what I meant by keeping lip out of the mouthpiece. I try to des describe it, but, you know, uh, I know that I get kind of carried away with I know what I'm talking about. So what I, I mean is keep lip from protruding into the mouthpiece. I think it's very key um, that you keep, you know, the inside part. What I mean is the red of the lip from going into the mouthpiece because that's where you know it starts to it gets pinned by the rim of the mouthpiece and it starts to swell up and the sound starts to close off and you lose uh endurance and that kind of thing so i'm just talking about forming an m here and placing the mouthpiece and uh and getting the vibration started that way um some people ask about the ratio of top to bottom. Was I addressing that? I'm not addressing that. I, you know, to me, the most important thing is keeping the inside diameter of the mouthpiece above that dividing line, uh, which on me is the red. There's that dividing border and the top lip. I want to make sure that the inside diameter of the um, mouthpiece is above that dividing border. I think that's honestly the most important part uh, for me of, of having endurance and range and evenness and all that kind of stuff. And it's a common uh, setup I've seen in all great trumpet players, irrespective of, you know, we also talked about horn angle in that video, irrespective of their horn angle, you know, all those great players have, you know, at least some of that inside diameter above the red. So anyway, uh, so getting to the, um, the things, you know, some people asked if I was, uh, when I talked about the sweet spot, if I was talking about the center, all right. Um, and yeah, it really kind of depends on, on what your concept of the center is, all right, to be honest, because I find that um, as brass players, when we start talking about the center, um, you know, a lot of people turn it into a verb. You have to center the sound, um, you know, and so what that does is it makes it start to compact the sound. All right. And so it starts to get more like this and more strained, um, you know, and we think we're projecting because we're all going, Eat, you know. Um, and it projects, but yeah, not in a way that, that people want to hear, right? I mean, we've all heard that tenor, right? He's like, come for me. And, you know, you don't want to hear that. But he thinks he's projecting because he's got that sound, you know, you know, squeezed up real tight. And, you know, he's got a tight core, as people like to say in the trumpet, you know. But let's face it, um, that's, that's not a sound that um, musicians on uh, other instruments strive for, Right. All right. They're always striving for, if you listen to all the great musicians, irrespective of instrument or whether a singer or whatever, they all have this effortlessness of production. All right. They breathe and sing or breathe and blow. Or, you know, if it's a string instrument, they just put, the, they set their bow to the string and boom, sound starts coming out. All right. And it's something that we should strive for as well, that effortlessness. And along with that comes that, what I call the immediacy of response, which some people a lot of people say, well, don't you mean getting a good attack? Uh, no, I don't, honestly. Um, I mean, look, if you have the instrument responding, your lips vibrate right where the horn wants it to vibrate right away. You can do whatever you want with that initial attack, right? Um, so uh, you can make it hard. You can make it round. You can have hardly anything at all, depending on what kind of musical statement you want to make, which is what great violinists do. They have so many different uh, types of articulations that they talk about, you know, and 
Why do we limit ourselves to ta and maybe da, which we don't really do that much. A lot of times, most most trumpet players just like ta, ta, ta and everything. And it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's not a good way to live because, you know, it, it doesn't give you a lot of musical flexibility, right? Do you ever leave a recital of a good violinist going, wow, they play with such great attack? No, you don't. You're laughing right now, right? Because it's ludicrous to think about that. All right, we have to think of ourselves as musicians. So we have that immediacy of response where the instrument resonates right where, you know, the physical, acoustical principles that govern it want it to resonate. All right, let's face it. You got a piece of pipe. There's a spot where it resonates at A equals 440, right? I don't care who you are, you know. I mean, if you see, you know, tuning slide variations this much, you know, between people, you know, it's not because, you know, they have dent different dental structure, all right? There's the, the differences in, you know, our face, our mouth, and all that kind of stuff. They play minor, very minor roles. They do play some role. I'm not going to say they don't. But they play very minor roles in where the instrument wants to resonate. The mouthpiece also plays a role, okay? But uh, by and large, you know, the, the variations are going to be pretty minimal, all right? The tuning slides, I think, are built somewhere between a quarter and a half inch tops, you know, to resonate at 440. All right. So if you're pulled out too far and you're probably still being told you're sharp, it's because you're, you know, really muscling everything into place instead of allowing it to fall into place. All right. And so this is, uh, you know, I, I started going through this, these epiphanies about this stuff. I heard the New York Philharmonic probably about 20 years ago. Um, they were playing Bruckner Six. The Scherzo has got these great, like, um, trumpet fanfares and, the trombones just play downbeats on the downbeat major chords. Boom, boom. And it's like almost all you could hear, but it didn't sound like they were forcing because they are all hitting that instrument right where it wants to resonate, you know, and um, perfectly in tune. So it's just like boom, boom. And it's just like, whoa, you know. Um, and, you know, they had the luxury of, of being able to set their tuning slide or, or, or move their slide to wherever the instrument is perfectly in tune and they can play with that same resonant sound on every note and as trumpet players we have to do alternate fingerings and you know lipping notes down which if you lip a note down you're not playing where the instrument wants to resonate so you're not getting that kind of effortless sound that we want to get i put after after hearing the new york philharmonic new york philharmonic trombones i put one of these bad boys on my trumpet i went to uh joe Selmansberger, great repairman here in memphis and told him what i was looking for and he picked stuff up off the floor of his shop and built this thing for me. And I know there's uh, several uh, several uh, repairmen and uh, instrument technicians who who make these now. Um, so I know a lot of people are getting them. But you know, uh, it's it's really a lifesaver. I don't know why everyone doesn't have one. Because you know, I'm sorry. If you lip it down, you're not playing where the instrument wants to resonate. You know, and you say, well, you know, my horn plays really well in tune. Well, you know, not everybody else plays in tune. We have to be able to adjust to other people. All right. So, um, you know, being a musician is a lot more, uh, is a lot more, uh, you, you can't go into any situation going, well, I'm right. I'm in tune. This is it. You know, no, <laughs> in tune is, is relative, you know, it's a, a social construct or whatever. It's like, it's, it really is a, is a thing that uh, is, ephemeral it goes sometimes from bar to bar you know um depending on you know what key you're in you know who else is playing you're playing with and that kind of stuff so you have to be able to be flexible and if you're going to be flexible you might as well be able to, to play right where the instrument wants to resonate on every note right so um yeah you know a lot of times if we're you know if we're forcing again this sound um you know and and trying to muscle it and centric, you know, to get it to project, all right, again, don't make it project, let it project, all right, you, you know, if you're relaxed with your body, you have a strong set here so that you know that the strength is going to be there, and you're resonating where the instrument wants to resonate, you can play very loud and very soft, you know, and you can also, um, you know, you change your equipment around to get different types of sounds, you know, different mouthpieces, different trumpets, and, you know, you can switch pretty easily, but if you're, you know, you if you're relying on that, uh, t that you know, t on everything, then you're going to need that fast burst of air to force the vibration, 
and nobody wants to to hear that well i mean you know it's appropriate sometimes but you know you lock yourself into a box so if you are not having that immediacy of response right when you you know breathe blow and the vibration is happening right where the horn wants to resonate if that's not happening for you then we fall into two things we like force it out with that hard tongue that burst of air or we sneak into it that dwa dwa and so, you know a lot of times the same player will do both things you know and you don't want to you know have to start ta da 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 dee da or wa da you know that kind of thing all right so um you know another thing you know again since trumpet players we always have this tendency to want to muscle everything and go sharper and sharper you know um jimmy stamp has a thing in his great uh studies uh you know in daily daily uh, studies book where he says you know when, when going up think down when going down think up you know and i get what he's saying there um you know as you're going down you want to keep that you know keep the set right and that's important but again i like to think when going up think down when going down think down because if we always are going for that bottom where things want to resonate you know then i think we're getting a much better sound all right so um for instance i i I always work on this and I start every day kind of like this, but bending tones. And as you bend back up, you stop where you get to that spot where everything is kind of like, uh, got a lot more stuff in it, a lot more, uh, vibration in the sound. And that's, that's what you want to look for. You know, don't go past that point, you know, and check yourself with the tuner, but not, don't look at the tuner while you're doing it. All right. You start the note, peek at the tuner, see where you are, look away, do your bending and then stop. Let the sound be your guide. And nine times out of ten, you're going to find when you're playing with that, that good sound, you're going to be a lot lower on the tuner than when you first started that note, you know. So that's the kind of thing, you know, I like to um, do, just kind of like make sure I get remind myself of, of where I want to be. You know, you hear this all the time and this might be an issue with you is, you know, uh, like in the promenade in pictures, you know, you start with a G F and then the end of that first phrase is also G F. But nine times out of 10, that G F is higher than it was when we started. So we've got to make sure that that's our home base. We always think of the low notes. You know, if you think of the sound of the low notes, then the sound of the high notes will follow because what happens is we start to kind of like creep up. We we do a little bit of this as we go higher, the relative pitch starts getting sharper and then we have to bring everything else up. And, you know, by the time we get to that A flat at the end, there's no way we can get it up to the pitch that we have now readjusted to. You know what I'm saying? So if we keep everything down, then we're going to be able to just kind of keep everything nice and resonant and always hone in on that, you know, those notes, those low notes, no matter what you're playing, if it's promenade or whatever, you know, always key in on the low notes and phrase. So say, you know, always going blah, blah, instead of then when you get in the body, you know, and the low C is like, you know, hardly, it, it hardly comes out. So, um, and you can always tell when somebody's going to clam the A flat because the, the A flat before is not, uh, it doesn't sound good. You know, think about the sound of the note you're on, you know, never skip ahead. Right. So, um, you know, and then, you know, you can, you can switch things around, you know I mean? Cause there are times, you know, like, like if you're playing West Side Story or something, you know, you got to like, stick a lead mouthpiece in, you know, and if you're, again, hitting the sweet spot of the instrument and you let that equipment do the work, let your lead mouthpiece do the work, then, you know, you're not going to like have to do all this to make it happen. You just kind of, you know, let it happen. So I don't know if I can do this, right? <laughs> Let's see what happens here. So I've got my lead mouthpiece. So you got to do that. You got to play cool and you got to play the rumble. You got to play all that stuff with your lead mouthpiece. But then at the end, you got to come back with this soft, delicate, 
you know, melody on somewhere. Everybody knows how it goes. So, you know, but if you're, again, if you do your lead playing by hitting the sweet spot and you've got the same approach for your soft playing, then, you know, hopefully, you know, it's okay. You know, I mean, that's about as scary as it gets after playing all the stuff you just played, right? But again, if you think about the sweet spot, letting the equipment do the work, then, you know, it gives you much better odds, much better chances. All right. So, um, yeah, so that's, I guess, covers most of the bases there. Uh, drop any comments or questions um, in the comments section. And um, I'll try to answer as much as I can. Um, and uh, anyway, practice hard and always find that sweet spot. Bye.